Um, hi, everyone. I'm Scott, uh, professor at Temple University. Um, I teach graphic arts, uh, graphic design um, for a really, really, really long time. 30 years this year. I started when I was 10. So, you know, um, that, that was a really bad joke. Um, and I started, I mean, I'm a traditional graphic designer. I had a practice for a long time. And I started focusing on posters around 2005 when a friend of mine also, um, oh, an amazing poster artist, um, Joe Scorsoni, um, SD posters, if you're interested, Joe Scorsoni and Alice Druding, um, said to me, like, why don't you design posters? So that's where it all started. And it's been quite a ride. I'm gonna share my screen. I can kind of go over. Um, can you let me share my screen? I think I did. Right now it says disabled. What about now? Yes. So I have a little um, keynote presentation, which I'll start. Um, if you have any questions along the way, you can interrupt me. It's totally fine. Okay, so full contact bowling. What is full contact bowling? Uh, many, 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 many years ago, actually before I started teaching, so a long time ago, it was right at the beginning of uh, computers. So this is back 1987, 1988, when the Mac first started happening. And at the same time, you had cable TV and you started to get, um, not nowhere near like it is today, but there was a lot more media than there had been ever before. So I was in my, uh, my studio, I was an art director at the time for an advertising agency talking with one of my designers. And we were sort of talking about, I, I don't even know if reality TV started then, maybe it started about then, about what was going on. And I kind of jokingly said, what's next, full contact bowling. And it kind of stuck. Um, and so as time goes on, you're all aware that we're bombarded with all this media. Um, and it kind of, filters into my work. So I guess my work is also full contact bowling. This idea of anything goes anymore. There doesn't just seem to be too many boundaries on what you can get away with and um, so-called news media that lies. And it's just really quite a time we're living in. So that, that's where the full contact bowling comes in. And then the work I do, I'm a social uh, designer. I do a lot of environmental work, uh, which you'll see. So it all kind of plays into this idea of full contact bowling. Um, this will actually have some augmented reality. So I do have the videos along with me, but if you wanna go grab the QR code on your phone, you can download this Artivive app. Uh, and then it's up to you. Uh, like I said, I'll have the augmented uh, videos along with it, but it's kind of interesting to actually see it function on your phone. So I'll give you a few seconds to download that if you wanna see some of you are grabbing it. So a big part of what I've done teaching and professionally, I've always worked with um, sound and animation. So this technology was kind of a natural for me. I, I don't have the opportunity to do it as much as I'd like. And I'm actually right in the process of illustrating a children's book that uh, uses augmented reality. So hopefully I'll get to use it a lot more. So um, I always ask my students, and, and I'm sure Olga also has her inspiration. I have my inspiration. Kind of like, what is your inspiration? What motivates you? What excites you about design? Um, what sort of makes you happy? I, I know that most designers, we are collectors of visual objects. Um, I used to collect a ton of toys. I, I, now I'm, I kind of have more posters than you can imagine. I don't think there's a square inch of my house or my office where there isn't a poster hanging. That's my collection now. Um, so this, this is not my work. This is an artist by the name of Saul Bass, a very famous American graphic designer. Um, he's kind of my hero. He was part of the New York School of Design um, and really started what we do in design. I, I would consider him one of some of the godfathers of modern graphic design. He works with really simple, bold shapes, almost cut paper kind of shapes. This is long before technology. Um, his, I love his hand on typography um, and how he tells stories. So you'll see him in my work. 
You also might see a little bit of Art Chantry. He's another um, designer, um, really bold colors, simple graphics. Um, and I also love this gutsy type. And, and you'll start to see that a little bit in my work as well. So these artists uh, I've known forever. Um, I have their work hanging around my house as well. And so I kind of use this is like if I'm ever stuck or ever need some sort of inspiration, I might go, what would Saul Bass do? Um, another thing I found a number of years ago is these, I mean, look like posters. They're not. These are actually matchbook, matchbox covers. They're very small. Um, and what I loved about them is, first of all, they make amazing images. And you'll see that I'm an image maker. Um, and it's cheap printing, really cheap printing. So it's on this inexpensive paper with really cheap ink going through a really inexpensive press. And you get all this kind of um, off registration and it's not perfect and it's grainy and it's inky. And I love all of that. And so you'll also see this kind of aesthetic in my work. I just love this kind of imperfectness that, that this kind of cheap printing gives you. So this was one of my first posters. You can kind of see everything I just spoke about kind of lives here. Simple, bold image, kind of an inky, broken up kind of visual. And this happened um, after Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Um, and this was what we were asked to do as designers was design a poster, produce, I think I produced 50 of these. You donate them, then they would sell them. And the money would raise, uh, they'd raise money for the victims of Hurricane Katrina. So this is a poster I did, and it was one of many epitaphs I've done. You can see where they're just dates. We've had many tragedies in the world, unfortunately, and I'm given too many opportunities to do posters like this. This is my office at school. You can see I have posters everywhere. Um, some of them have migrated back to my studio. Some are still at school. You can see the Art Chantry posters to the right. Um, there's a po posters ac across the way is um, Rizard uh, Kaja, who just passed, brilliant poster designer, and uh, who's a Polish poster designer. And the other one is Tomas Boglowinski, also another um, Polish poster designer. I have, uh, I have kind of a soft spot for Polish poster design. I just love everything about it. Um, Polish designers always start off as fine artists, so they can paint and they understand and they can paint typography, and then they become designers. And I'm a little bit of a fine artist too. I'm a builder, so I, I really love the way they kind of think about imagery. It's it's very it's it's very storytelling. It's a lot of narrative. Um, there's certain emotion to it, which I find interesting. So I had this stuff everywhere. Uh, so this is, again, my office. You can see my little toys. Um, a lot of them are old, and I'm a child. And yes, I do play with them now and again. I'll wind them up. Why not? They're fun. But I really got them more for the packaging. Um, if you see the Atomic Man, it's got great type. It's got interesting color. So this is just stuff around me that always gives me inspiration, that I, it makes me happy. Um, so this is actually my studio at home, and these are black light posters. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you shine a big ultraviolet light, and these posters kind of glow. So these are all silkscreen posters. The one at the bottom left and the top right, this is Art Chantry's work. And the one in the middle is by an artist named Ralph Reese. Um, and it's a political poster of a president that hasn't been in office since about 1973. But I actually had this poster in my bedroom when I was about 10. So I didn't know what it meant then, but um, I know what it means now. And I, I love this poster. And yes, I do turn on my black light and enjoy these from time to time. So process. Process to me is the most important part of design, not just poster design, any design, uh, not even just graphic design. It's how, how do you come to your ideas? Um, and it's something I stress to my students. I always want to see process. I always want to see thinking. Everyone starts, everyone kind of starts off the same, but then we kind of go off into our own areas of things that, again, that, that, that work for us. So um, I start off with research, tons of research. And even if I know something, if I, even if I feel like I know a lot about a topic, I'm still researching because there's always new things you learn, you forget things. So this is sort of a typical um, thing. I, I will mind map 
all the time. Sometimes the second I get a prompt, I'm mind mapping right on the prompt. I don't even give myself a clean sheet of paper. The second I have ideas, I want to go. Um, I'll have inspiration around me. That's what I told you about earlier. These are these matchboxes, this wonderful off register and these awkward negative spaces. And I, I love tension in an image. And I think these things kind of give this really wonderful tension. Um, they're there because they needed to separate color and it's really cheap so that they're aggressive little separations where now we would do something that's you know more in line, more clean. But I like the fact that they were done fast and cheap. That's what I love about them. And then a mood board, although my mood boards never look like this, but I do collect all kinds of visuals for myself constantly. I keep a picture file. I have flat files that are just filled with sketches and visuals that I can always refer to. I always like to have things handy. And even though I might sketch something for another project, sometimes they come back to you and it's really good to keep. So um, I'll talk a little bit, a little bit about a little more about this as I move on. So why am I showing you a pencil and a sharpener? Um, because to me, this is the only way to um, come up with a lot of ideas quickly. And in fact, I don't allow my students to go on the computer right away. I want them to do what I call quick sketches or many people call them quick sketches. So where you're doing 40 or 50 sketches in 20 minutes, like really fast, ideas, ideas, ideas. It doesn't matter if they're good ideas, doesn't matter if they're bad ideas. It doesn't matter if they don't make sense. You just wanna come up with as many different ideas as you can. And the best way to do this is with a good old fashioned pencil and paper. I think if you jump on the computer, which I do not allow my students to do in the beginning, I think it slows you down. I think it stops a free flow of ideas. You're surrounded by all this iconography and tool palettes. Um, I do let the ones who have um, iPads and Procreate work in Procreate. To me, it's the same kind of idea. Um, but I, I'll sketch on anything. Um, I'll sketch on backs of envelopes, torn pieces of paper. Wherever I see something, I always have a pencil handy. If I have an idea, down it goes. So these are my wonderful, lovely sketches. So I'm telling you when I move, I really move. And I, I try to stress this to my students. I show my awful sketches because I want you and my students and everyone else to know that it's when you're coming up with ideas, this ideation stage, it's not about pretty, it's about ideas. Um, and the more you come up with, the better success you'll have. So I'm cropping in on one because this one to the, to the kind of middle left is where I ended up. Um, I always kind of chuckle at my sketches because I always write these weird little notes, which sometimes are really preachy, stop wasting water. And I would never do that in a poster. I don't think you should be preachy, but when I sketch, I guess just part of my thinking, stop using drinking water to flush. I'm, I'm, I'm very demanding, but if they don't end up that way. So th the solution we're looking at here with the funnel um, has to do with uh, water recycling. So I'm gonna show you um, kind of the, uh, skeleton I create for a lot of my work and then the finished poster. So to the left is the skeleton from that sketch. And basically it's me just figuring out placement on the page. You can see I'm using some of the graphics there, but a lot of things changes. A lot of things change when I go into Photoshop. So the, the concept here is collecting rainwater and then using it to clean your clothes, to flush your toilet and in your garden. Obviously you can't drink it, but it is useful water. And as we know, um, we are running out of water, not just in this country, but Earth is. And so any way we can um, help this cause, I think is important. So I do a lot with water um, and nature. It, it's a big part of my work. So you can kind of see this inky texture thing that I spoke about that I really love. Um, so how do I create that? This wait, on the left is my very, very first experiment. And the right is, a, is like a, a huge detail of this result. And so back when I was in school 137 years ago, um, we used copy machines. And back then they weren't very good. And that was great for us because we could run things through a copy machine and get this really weathered, broken, inky kind of line. Now everything is so good that I didn't know what to do. So I had this old fax machine. I'm not even sure if you all know what a fax machine is, but it's, it's, an, it's, it's a way of copying. And, and do you know what a fax machine is? Oh, they don't. Oh, my God, I'm so old. Um, so it's, it's a way of sending information through a phone line, which seems crazy now. 
Um, and what it does, it's kind of like a copier. So on the left are my first experiments. The skull was not something I found online. This is actually a plunger for a syringe. I actually made that. And I kind of wanted to see the results. And so the way I did this was I, in Illustrator, I created a vector image and I printed it to this textured paper, like a watercolor paper almost. So that immediately gave me some texture. Then I took that watercolor paper and I, I ran it through this fax machine on more textured paper. And that's where the magic happened for me. I was able to create all these shapes that had this really wonderful texture that I was looking for. So these are three posters that use that technique. Um, I'll talk about them briefly. The one on the left was a 25 year um, remembrance of Chernobyl, the nuclear disaster. And so I, I use this sort of um, steam stack from a nuclear power plant as a candle to remember. And all the typography on the inside is all the people who died that day and how they died. It's really quite horrific. Um, and you can see this texture is part of it. There, there, at one point, I did a lot with this. Now I kind of work in many different ways. The one in the middle um, is kind of an interesting poster. I, I did it many, many years ago. And it's for um, welling in Japan, where they were um, capturing wells. And I, I am um, a big environmentalist and an animal lover. So this was kind of an important topic to me. So I started off with the Japanese flag, the round circle, white field, the rising sun, and that became a fishbowl filled with blood. And all these folks going into the fishbowl, trying to capture this humpback well. Um, this, the reason why the well is white is for two reasons. One, contrast, very important in a poster, but also it's an albino well called Migaloo. He's very rare, one of a kind. And he was with the other wells. Now he was saved, he was captured, but this was a kind of an emotional moment for me making this poster. And you might notice this weird kind of um, glitch at the top of the um, fish tank right before the ring. And this was sort of one of those accidents that I kept. When I was using that technique I spoke about and I ran it through a fax machine, it's a very old machine, the paper was thick and got caught. So I only got about three quarters of the image and I didn't really think much about it because go in Photoshop, flip it, Photoshop it out, no problem. When I flipped it, I had this weird overlap and it looked like this horrible slash running through the image and it created this tension that I really liked. So I kept it. So that's an accident, um, not really an accident, it was just an overlap. And I decided that I liked the glitch, the, the slash, the cut across this. And so I kept it as part of the poster and I'm kind of glad I did. The poster to the right, this image of Africa, um, was also using that technique. Uh, this was for lack of water. You'll see water is a big theme in my work. Uh, this was also done a number of years ago. Unfortunately, things don't change. In this case, I used a piece of shattered glass instead of dried earth uh, because I just felt like that was, that wasn't just the dryness, but it also gave me that kind of razor's edge. You didn't want to touch it. It was sharp. It was painful. And I felt that it was kind of beyond dry. And the color palette, believe it or not, that tan color in the background was taken from the water that um, Africans have to drink in certain parts of Africa. It looks like old, muddy mustard water. It was really quite horrible. And it looks quite beautiful here. Um, but in fact, when I look at it, I don't see beauty. I, I, I see this horrible, muddy water that these poor people um, have to drink. So you'll see that I also put a lot of emotion into my work. Um, I choose color for specific reasons. Um, and you'll see I do a lot of work in black and white because of the emotional effect I think black and white has on the viewer. So here's some more lousy sketches. Uh, this was on, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's blue lines here. This is on a four by five little sketchbook. And so the sketches are only about an inch and a half, two inches, really quite small. And this was for, I, I did, for two years, I did work for any age Ukraine. The first year was about uh, drugs. The second year was about abstinence. Um, and I don't think abstinence is a way to prevent AIDS. I think kids your age are gonna have sex. And so to say don't, I thought was silly, but I wanted to be part of it. And I knew the age group I was in. And so um, I thought a little bit of humor might help. And so I came up with this idea. It's really sort of simple, this Y with a belly button and a zipper for the idea of zip up. And when I try to go make this poster, I hated everything I did, it just didn't work. It didn't have the energy of my sketch. So on the right-hand side, that top image, the very first one with the belly button, I scanned it in at like 3,200 DPI and left it alone. So that poster on the left is 
about the image started off at around two inches and now it's 40 inches. And that's just my pencil line from the sketch. And all the little specks, I don't know if you can see those specks, it's actually the fibers in the paper. That's how much I blew this up. And I just left it alone. I, I just liked the energy of that line. A graphic line didn't work. I could not reproduce this any other way other than just scaling my sketch up. Now, truth be told, the button up, it, it's, uh, it, it's the brother over here, that was about three or four sketches that I scanned and put together. I, I couldn't get that spontaneity that I wanted in the first one because the first one was just a sketch. It was never meant to be a poster. Um, and so these are actually silkscreen. They're quite large. Um, and I love how they came out and they're kind of tongue in cheek. They're a little bit humorous. And I think that they served uh, their purpose. Photography entered my work um, accidentally. And it's really changed what I've done um, with my work. So the very first thing I ever did with photography, and I really didn't use photography again to a number of years later, was a poster I did 2008 for uh, an earthquake in China. Um, another epitaph, I do way too many of those. And I'm showing you this poster less about the poster itself. It was the first thing I've ever used photography on. And I printed it on this really beautiful textured watercolor paper. It had a lot of a tactile quality to it. But during this process, I collected a lot of images of cracks in the earth. So um, in 2011, we had the tsunami in Japan. And this is the poster I did that, another epitaph. And, and I kind of approach this poster in a way that I don't normally approach anything. I, I never take anything off the table. Anything goes with my initial sketches. I don't care how ridiculous the idea is. I just, whatever comes to my mind, I, I, want to look, I, I want to put down on paper. But I had done a poster already with a red circle. And I kind of felt like in this exhibition that there'd be a lot of Japanese flags. And, and there were. Um, and so avoiding it really paid off. I think I have an interesting poster I'll tell you a little bit more about. It also won um, the competition. So sometimes when we say to ourselves, like, I feel like a lot of people are gonna be doing this kind of thing, forcing yourself not to do it could be a mistake. In this case, it turned out really well for me. Um, and so the way this worked is I started off looking at this crack. This crack is something I collected from the China poster. And I have no idea why, but it just said Japan to me. So I started Photoshopping it uh, into Japan. So I basically took Japan into Photoshop with that crack and just spent some time um, working in Photoshop uh, to make it as perfect as I could. I'm, I'm kind of a perfectionist in Photoshop. I, I don't want anything to look Photoshopped. I kind of want it to look natural. Obviously, this would have to be Photoshopped. So you'll see a detail of how far I get in, how far down the rabbit hole I might go to make every little crack, every little crevice, every little um, sharp edge uh, as realistic as possible. So it takes some time, but I have a lot of fun um, doing it. It's a real joy for me. At this point, I'm not thinking creatively, I'm just kind of working. It, you know, I know, I've been using Photoshop. Well, I don't know if you believe me, but I've used every version of Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign to ever exist. So a really long time I've been using Photoshop. Um, and uh, so in, in the end, the one on the left, I'll speak about the one on the right in a minute. Um, there was an actual leaf growing out of my driveway. And that was my concept that Japan will rise again out of this death, out of this crack in the, in the, in the rock, life will form again. So it was a very positive kind of idea. Now, photography was new to me. So I initially kind of looked at it the way I looked at everything else graphically. And I think if you look at both of them, the one on the left works much better. It more emotional. Um, I think there's more of a connection to what was happening. And so sometimes, not always, but sometimes the way in which we execute could communicate as well. And this really changed a lot for me. So I, I move into kind of my black and white mode or mood. And I've done a lot of work like this. Um, this fish actually kind of put me on the map. Um, this might be my, my most famous poster. It's kind of been everywhere. It was on the cover of Graffiti's posters. It won a platinum. It won a gold in Ecuador. Um, it's done really well for me. And boy, if I knew what I did, every poster would win, but I have no idea. Sometimes you, you have a concept and, a, and a, a vision and people just are attracted to it. I, I don't know why. Um, not everything I do, I'm sure Olga will say the same thing. Um, you have the same success with it. it. It really, and so what? And so what? 
I, I don't get too wrapped up in it. Uh, I, I always try to have a story. I always try to, I mean, I'm like I said, perfectionist. I always try to make the best possible image I can. And for the most part, I think um, they're memorable, but not always, and such is life. So here's my wonderful sketch again. And I started off with doing some research and I saw this quote, two thirds of the uh, fish population uh, suffer from plastic ingestion. In other words, if I'm eating that fish, I'm also eating plastic. And because I work so quickly, I leave myself notes all the time because I would never have remember they were single use plastic bags. This is one of 150 quick sketches. So I'm moving really fast. And I came back to this idea and um, I went around my house and I grabbed plastics and some fishing line and some awful plastic bottle caps. I have a really nice a digital camera, a SLR digital camera, I've had it for years. I use it all the time. I got some, some mat board, some natural light. I am not a photographer. And I took this photograph and then I found some stock imagery. So the image on the stock is actually a government image. Any image that you find on a government website is um, free, for you to, free for you to use. So like go to the NASA website, they have these great posters, they have videos, all this stuff is free, um, .gov. So I grabbed one of those and then I grabbed another bass. This was a stock image. I think I paid like $2 for it, pretty cheap. And I took my photographs and these two stock images and created this poster. Based on the statistic, two thirds of the world's fish suffer from plastic ingestion. And this kind of moved me in this direction of really simple, which still goes back to this kind of Saul Bass idea. These are really simple images, um, limited color palette, but uh, using photography, which like I said, really changed a lot for me. So this was the first in the series. And I always knew I wanted to do a series and you know, you get busy and the older will tell you, you teach and you're producing work for people and you have a studio and things are going crazy. And so I never had the opportunity until one winter when the power went out, so that's when Plastic Bird came about. Now I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm also a maker, I'm an artist, I'm a sculptor, I build things, um, I do etchings and printmaking. So when I can include this and part of my work so exciting because although you know Photoshop is great and all, I, I, know, I know like the back of my hand, there's nothing new there for me. I'm kind of on the attack. I don't get this same excitement that I used to because it's just a means to an end for me. Um, so. The lights went out, I sat by a window, grabbed some plasticine, uh, had a photograph of a bird and I started sculpting and I made this really quick armature. And then I asked all my students to, cause all of you eat everything in plastic. Sandwiches come in plastic, candy comes in plastic. So I asked them, I said, when you're done with all your Lunchables and your candy and your popcorn, stick them by my office and I would come in every morning and there'd be bags of plastic waiting for me. And I would go home and I would cut individual feathers out I created this armature and I would pin the feathers to the sculpture. And then I, this is a hanger and some electrical wire and um, hot glue. And then I would tape these larger feathers one at a time on the wings to build my bird. And you can see various kind of um, areas of it. And then I photographed it. Um, this is a detail. So you can see I cut a lot of feathers out. And since it's 99% uh, will uh, suffer plastic ingestion by 2050, there's only 1% the beak in the eyeball. Even the eyelash on the bird is a plastic wrapper. So there's a lot of Photoshop and a lot of photography and a lot of sculpture. Um, like the straws were done separately. Obviously that wasn't part of the armature to make the legs. And so this is kind of how I work an image. Um, these images can be three, 400 layers. Um, close to a terabyte in size are really quite large. So I have um, a pretty strong computer that keeps plugging away and like about eight external hard drives that I back everything up because my files are huge. Um, they're saved as a large format Photoshop, not even a PSD, they're too big for that. So I really work with a lot of layers and every layer gets its own shadow and own highlight. And so everything is always done like one at a time. I'm crazy, I know. And this was the third in the series um, called Eden. So it's uh, sea, land, and air. And this is this idea again of plastics in ruining the environment and destroying the earth. And here is a couple stock photos, the top of the flower and the globe. The straw I actually made in Photoshop from scratch. And the bags are photographs that I took of uh, plastic bags that I had and still have because I won't throw them away. 
uh, and I don't use them. I'm, I think I'm one of the only people that leave the market with paper bags or my own reusable bags. Um, and so I, I did all three of these and they're actually gonna be in Robin Landa's book uh, coming up next year, which is kind of exciting. That's a detail. And we have biophilia. Uh, and this was also using that same technique. Now here, I think each, these are stock images. I think they may have cost me about two bucks each. So it's not a big expense, but it's all what you do with them. So I got this image of a heart and I brought it in Photoshop and I started to think of things like, well, an elephant trunk could be an artery. And then I had this caterpillar. Then I thought, well, it would be cool if a caterpillar was eating a leaf. The leaf becomes then these more arteries. Um, and I don't know all the parts of the heart. Um, I'm not a doctor, uh, but I followed it with the butterfly and the frog to create all these components uh, to create this idea of uh, humans in nature. So here's an interesting project. This is another pry left because the process I went through was so crazy. I did my quick sketches. You can see that to the side. And the idea here was for um, processed foods. And the reason why I'm laughing is because you know what a frozen dinner is, but I grew up with something called a TV dinner and it came in foil and you put it in a toaster oven and I'm old. So I'm thinking like, this is what I'm gonna do. Not realizing that it's, you know, 20, 2019 is thinking one, and that um, everything's in a microwave now and we don't put these things in the oven. And so this awful, awful kind of Photoshop sketch was just to see if I'm able to make it work. So I thought I had this idea, I was all excited. I went to the supermarket to buy my TV dinner. Um, this is what they look like. Believe it or not, I used to like this. They're awful. They come out of the oven, half will be burnt and half will be frozen. And I grew up eating this horrible stuff. But when I got to the supermarket, this is what was there. Doesn't look much more appetizing. So this is something that came out of my microwave. And I chose this for a couple of reasons is I wanted the meat and potatoes. Ugh, it's really awful. And in my head, it kind of looked like a skull, I guess. Um, and so everything else, this is 100% Photoshop. So everything then is Photoshop. So this is another one of these two, 300 layers of me making this look like a plastic tray that you pop in a microwave, but is actually a skull and crossbones. So the fork and the knife, I just photographed on a white tablecloth. That's the background. I brought everything in pieces in Photoshop, even my drop shadows Photoshop. Um, I'm not a photographer, like I said. Um, and then in the middle of the nose, again, I kind of laugh because it's like this personal joy for me is a chocolate brownie, which was always my favorite part growing up. So this is my poster for processed foods. So as you, you can imagine, I was asked to do a, a 120 different <laughs> COVID posters. I think I was asked to do eight COVID posters during COVID for different reasons. So these two were kind of early on. The one on the left um, is kind of that black and white style that I use and the idea of really making the caduceus that represents nurses really an angel. So I changed the wings a little bit. I gave it a halo and the nurses are now protecting us like an umbrella blocking the COVID and thanking them. And so um, Temple asked all the faculty, not just me, all the faculty do something. So if you were a writer, you could write. If you, if you weren't in the creative arts, you could do something else. So I did this poster. The one on the right, I actually had a lot of fun with. This is for kids. This is very early on and they wanted to introduce kids to COVID. So print the poster out and color it in. So I did Super Nurse and I had a blast doing it. And I thought it was a really nice way to kind of let kids know about what was happening and that there's people here to protect us. Um, and so that was this poster. Jump to the end of COVID, well, not the end, but where we are now, I was asked to do things about um, kind of what's going to take place next. So to the left, it's pretty straightforward. The virus is life-giving. So I just, this took literally five minutes. I had the idea five minutes later, I had the poster. So I quickly made a syringe and illustrator. I do this technique with blurring and sharpening to kind of make it look less vectory. And then I just got Michelangelo's um, Sistine Chapel image, which is public domain uh, and popped it in the middle. It was really super simple. Uh, although I, I love the message and posters are all about message. To the right, you might recognize those matchbox covers that I love so much. So a friend of mine in Brazil, Marcos Manini, um, asked me to do something about post-COVID. And so I had a little, fun, little bit of fun since you only see us from the waist up. Um, you can wear anything from the waist down. And um, 
So this was just uh, like just something I, I threw together for him quickly. That was just a whole lot of fun. There's just a different way of looking at COVID from the beginning to the end. This is my latest poster. So I was recently invited to do a poster for Posters Without Borders. And the topic was civilitas or civility, how we treat one another. And my concept was we don't treat one another very well and we're hanging by a thread. And the idea of this rope that's starting to fray, that's how I looked at civility. But I wanted, uh, I wanted it to understand that we can help each other. So this poster actually caused me a bit of a fit. So you can see my sketch on the left. You can see my illustrator in the middle. And in the end, this is just the kind of um, skeleton I use in Photoshop. So when I first did this, if you look at the bottom right, you'll see it's, it's kind of culture or race related. And I thought that could be nice, but the problem is the poster is vertical. And so even though the poster you can rotate, I didn't want one race or one culture to be on top of another. And it was a problem. And so I rotated the image, so it's more of a tug of war, equal footing, but the image became too small. So I tried colors, every color under the sun, and I just hated all of it. I love the idea. I like the image. I hated the color with a white hot passion. So I decided it was a really simple idea and that I'm just going to go monochromatic and let it be about helping one another and getting the idea of race and culture out of it. Because when I thought about it, it shouldn't matter. And so this is my final poster, which I'm really pleased with. And it's still the idea of the fraying rope, but you can see hands are grabbing, even fingers are starting to touch. And it's the concept that we're stronger together. And the poster works both ways. So you flip it, the type stays in the same place, but now the people that were being helped are the ones helping. And I also like that message too, that once you help some, once someone helps you, now you turn around and help someone else. And then I added this little bit of texture in there, burlap, just to give a flavor of rope. So I didn't lose the visual itself. Motion. So I have motion in my posters. I use augmented reality. Um, there's a little bit of it here. This is not augmented reality. This was done back in 2015, where augmented reality really wasn't part of it. But I do have an animation for this poster. So every year, uh, my program at, at Temple um, it creates what's called Interact. And it's for students to do animation and websites and UX, UI. And this was Interact 13. And the person who run it was on leave. So I got to do it. And I love creepy movies. I love the idea of 13, bad luck, good luck. Like I love all this. So I was so lucky to do it. So I created this poster over here. All the posters are always based on a number and I wanted to keep that tradition alive. And so I have 13 and in the figure ground, you can see the cat. It's literally just the eyes and the positive negative space, the figure ground, some really sort of wicked type. I don't know if you could see it, but there's a creepy face staring back at you, a big eye in the middle at the top. Um, and so I turned this into an animation for a plasma screen. You hear it? So this was um, one of my first augmented reality posters. So you could actually point your phone using Artivive and you should see it play. I'll give you a few minutes. If not, the I do have a, a video. If that's what the image on the right is, is a video. But if you hold your phone up to it, it should play. And there should be sound. Is it working? Cool. We're trying to. Here, if you want, I have the video here. It's just cooler on the phone. I feel sound so important. And we have this technology with our phones that has speakers. So all of my ARs have sound. All So this is not augmented. This was something I recently had done, not the poster of the animation. The poster to the left, again about water, um, was done many, many years ago, um, like 15 years ago, like a long time ago. And the concept's pretty simple, is that the earth is running out of water and what we have, we're wasting going down the drain. 
And recently there was this exhibition called Diamond Water or Water Diamond, I can't recall. And one of the categories was animation. So I took this poster and I created this animation. This is not AR, so it's not gonna repeat. Um, and it's pretty quick, so I'll play it twice. But I took the water droplet and turned it into a diamond. And we're just letting it run down the drain. This one, the augmented reality is the payoff. You really need to see it move to understand the poster. So I'll give you an opportunity to look at it. Um, and then I'll play the video. Um, so the, the concept here is every time you release a balloon, um, it gets, animals eat it, they get strangled by it. Um, I am not a fan of the helium balloon, especially after doing this project. So the payoff is when the balloons are let go and the sound stops, you get the skull. Which brings me to my book, Making Posters. The, that's the bright, obnoxious thing behind me. So. Um, back in 2017, these things take forever. I got this email from the, pub, the um, editor from uh, Bloomsbury Publishing. Um, uh, someone who I know in posters recommended me. Um, they liked my work, so they reached out and asked me if I'd want to write this book. So of course, um, like of course your head swells this big. And you're like, oh my, look at me. Let me write this book. But it occurred to me that I'm dyslexic. I have ADHD and I've never written like a paper, much less a book. So I was not going to do this, but I told my wife about, oh, there's some cool thing happening to me. Can you believe this? They asked me to write this book. And she, um, she said, uh, let's do it. And I went, say what now? And I, she knows that I struggle writing. And what she said to me, and she also pointed it out, she went like this. She said, we need to get from here and put it on paper. So basically, she was gonna help me write this thing and I just had to come up with what it would be about. So the first part of it was we had to write a um, sample writing because I'd never written before, 2,500 words. And we spent so much time and we crafted it and made it perfect and we sent it out. And, and both of us were like, you know what? We're, it's not gonna happen, but this is okay. We worked really hard, we did our best. And they got back and we're like, yeah, we love it. Write this book. <laughs> So terrified, I'm terrified now. Um, and just before I signed the contract, this really amazing woman, Natalia Delgado reached out to me. I'd never met her before. And she said, I heard you're writing a book. Can I take part of it somehow? Like maybe I could write a chapter. And I looked at her and went, you wanna write half? So <laughs> she's like, yes. And now we're like the closest of friends. Obviously we spent the better part of two years talking with each, with each other every day. Um, she lives, she's Mexican, she lives in Canada, and I live on the East Coast, so we Skype two, three, four days a week for two years, and back and forth and back and forth, and she's like one of my closest friends, and I talk to her all the time, and we still never met in person. Crazy, right? Crazy. Um, so making posters, the cover is augmented, so if you want to try the augment here, it's kind of cool. I also have a video of it, um, and posters in the book are also augmented. So the last chapter is about all these cool posters. I'll, I'll get into more detail in a minute. So this, this gives you kind of a, a highlight of maybe about eight or nine posters in the book. And I try to treat each poster, the transition, based on the content of the poster. So the transitions aren't arbitrary. They, I thought about how I wanted them to relate to the poster itself. What's nice about this, although I haven't done it, I could easily update the animation. So if you've seen this, AR, I could completely change it. The next time you look at it, it'll be different posters. Um, it's one of the beauties of this technology. Um, so for those who didn't see it, here's just a quick little section of it. Um, so the twist led into the twist, obviously. Um, this was jazz, I wanted something soft. So this just sort of faded into this upside down. And then I thought about these curtains revealing the next poster and this image, um, kind of swings on a hook. So that's part of it. And then this animation, the corners flip down. So the corner of my animation then flipped down. So I, I try to tie in the transitions to what was happening. So the book has seven chapters. Um, 
my co-author and I designed the cover. We were paid a whopping $250 total, $125 each, and nothing for the design. They didn't want to pay us for the design, but I was not having them design it. It was too important to me. And um, I'm smiling because I know what a horrible person I can be. Uh, I, my students, when they do layout, I don't know if you all, I don't know what level you're at, but there's things called widows and orphans. These are words that are left by themselves or words that are by themselves. And, there, and I won't critique my students type if there's widows and orphans. They have to take care of that. Well, I needed to control that. And then we had these divider pages and I wanted to make sure the divider pages fell as spreads. So I was, I was nice, but a major pain in the ass. So I actually um, flowed all the content, placed all the images high res, where I wanted them, the size that I wanted them. I created the grid, I created the style sheets. Together, Natalia and I designed it, but I did the legwork because I'm nuts and turn them over a finished InDesign file. All they had to do was flow in the edited, the final edited copy. And I didn't get paid a cent. I didn't care because I'm really pleased with the book. And it actually just won a, a, Graf a Graffiti Award for design. So that alone was worth not being paid. So this is the timeline that you're familiar with. I, I love a timeline. I don't know why I love them. I like the way they look. I like the way they offer information. So I had this opportunity. I was doing a timeline. Even before I met with Natalia, the there was going to be a timeline in this book. Um, and so we, we just had a lot of fun designing it together back and forth. Um, we work really well together, not just writing, but designing. It was a great, great relationship. Then we get to do, do these divider pages, which was our, our turn to be graphic designer. She's also a graphic designer. So this starts off like a jigsaw puzzle. And so chapter three, I found this really cool letter form that I could then take a part of it and it becomes the L. So that puzzle piece actually fits in and completes the three. Um, and uh, the layout, you'll notice, I, I didn't have enough control to play with the rags, but there are no widows and orphans. Um, we were told we had two go arounds. I had six. The woman I work with was so nice and totally got it. So she let me go back a lot to make this as perfect as I could. And I was doing terrible things like page 43, second column, third paragraph, fourth line up from the bottom, break after the word that. Then that will re-rag your tie, then break. And I'm thinking these people are going to kill me. But they did it. God bless them. They did it. So this is, so we did these divider pages. This was done by Natalia. And then we got to do these really cool initial caps. Um, and so again, we had an opportunity to work together. I actually hired a former student of mine um, to do this. So this is Jess Lynn. She graduated seven or eight years ago. She's a great illustrator. So I asked her, I didn't ask her, I paid her um, to do this artwork for me. So all these dividers were kind of fun. And then each chapter has an essay. So you can read about um, the designer's process, how they came up with a concept, and then see the final result. There's seven of those through the book. Um, this is a section on context. I love context, so that's why I'm showing it for no other reason. Um, and you can just see the system I designed in. Uh, we used a double grid, um, a two column and a six column because the galleries required a different grid. Um, this is cool. I and mean, you probably can't grab the QR code. The posters to the left are edible. They're made with edible inks and they're edible paper and they're flavored and they're for kids. So you would grab, the kid would get this poster and then they could eat it. The poster on the right and the QR code, it's an interactive book. And what I mean by that is there's QR codes throughout the book. In this case, this QR code would lead you to a video and the video will explain how this Sonic poster works. So this is a Sonic poster. You can see down here, uh, the black and white, that's actually a circuit board, a printed circuit board. Then they print the inks over top. Then you download this app to your phone and you play the poster. And so if you go on that QR code, it shows you how the poster was made, shows you someone demonstrating it. So this is truly an interactive poster where you're actually playing music on the poster. There's posters in the book that are lights on the wall, that are um, scratch and sniff, that are aromatic. There's am amazing things you can do with posters. Every chapter has a gallery of about 
seven or eight spreads that show what, like this is about execution. So these posters all deal with different ways to execute an image. Even if you're using pasta, like Thomas does there in the upper right, quite brilliant. Um, and I'm gonna end here and then I'm, hopefully you have questions. This is the very last poster I did and it was an homage to a famous designer from your country. I'm from America. I'm a huge fan of Saul Bass. I told you how important he was to the graphic design movement. So I created a Saul Bass. Get it? It's really bad pun. And then I picked up some of his type. And since it's from America, it's red, white, and blue. So that's my presentation. I hope you have tons and tons of questions. I love questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Do we have questions? Uh, I hope. Uh, yeah, I think we might have a questions. Uh, maybe someone also wants, because we have students in class, but I think it's more people online that not here in the class. Whomever. Uh, I really, I really, uh, when you show your posters, I know where we met because I was uh, creating the first blog back to 2003. And I saw uh, these posters, so this is how we met. <laughs> and uh, actually some of your posters right now still in the US because they're on my, on my collection, poster collection for the first blog, which we showing time to time here. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing how small the world is right now. It is. Um, and that was, uh, it's also a great little community, our poster community. Yeah, this is what I also, okay, who asked? Okay, okay, give me one sec. Hi, um, I really enjoyed the presentation. I think all of your works that you showed today were really inspiring and I love seeing how you were able to like derive the final poster from um, the sketches that you showed. I was wondering if you ever like experienced artist block and like how you're able to get out of that or like, do you think you overwork sometimes and kind of exhaust all your ideas? Um, of course I have artist block all the time. Um, there's a lot of things that I do and I think it's a little different for everyone. Um, I am a swimmer, so I'll go for a swim listen to some music. And I think that sort of distraction, I'm still thinking about the project in the back of my head. Um, sometimes you just draw anything to get started. Sometimes you gotta step away for a couple of days and kind of think about your idea. Um, as long as you come back to it, usually something shakes loose. But usually it's, I think what I'm saying is take a step away from it um, and try to put it in your subconscious and not obsess on it. If you obsess on it, then you're just going to be chasing your tail. So I do, I try to forget about it, knowing that in the back of my head, gears are, are going, gears are going. So um, sometimes when you get away from something, come back to it, you have a different vision of it. And it, it usually helps. Uh, Scott, have you ever been like was tired of designing the poster? Like literally, you said, "Oh, I need a break. Like it's not my format anymore." Um, you mean if someone asked me? I mean, yeah, like in some way, like maybe you got tired of it because sometimes it happens. I know, like yeah, you know, um, it's such a. I mean, it's so much fun for me. Um kind of a nice escape from kind of everything to sort of concentrate and think that way and tell stories and kind of make image. I try to do something creative every day. Sometimes it's just meeting with my students and conceptualizing with them. So no, so far, I don't think I felt like I didn't want to do something. What are going to be a next book? It's not going to be an academic book. <laughs> Um, I don't have the personality for it. It, Like I said, I'm, I'm dyslexic and I have ADHD. It was really challenging. I wrote every single day uh, to the point my wife had to say, you have to take a day off because, and that's for two years. And I was teaching. So I, I just, 
was so paranoid and so I was not nice to be around. I hate to say it. However, I just finished illustrating and writing a children's book that I'm starting to animate for augmented reality. So that's what I'm working on right now. Um, I'm working on the animations. As a matter of fact, I was working on one of the animations today. They're a lot more sophisticated than poster animations because of the nature of it. So hopefully um, my next book will be this children's book. Well, you know, Olga, writing academic books is like, whew, it overtakes your life for two years. It was a challenge and I'm glad I did it. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I'm getting too old. <laughs> I, I want to start chilling a little bit. That was a lot of work. Two years, it's a pretty long, uh, yeah, pretty long ride for the book. Yes. I can see that. And you like, it's two authors and it's still, it's a lot of work. Yeah. I don't know if I could have done it without Natalia. She was amazing. I bet. She was always so relaxed and I am not like that. And she would always be able to calm me down, get me back focused. To tell you, it's the worst thing I've ever written. It's a piece of crap. No one's gonna to wanna to read it. That's kind of how I approach writing this book. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It, I, I, I bought the book and I really enjoyed it. I'm gonna bring it. I didn't bring it purposely to the class because I wanna students like meet you first and then I'll bring it next next class definitely and yeah, then you can really appreciate all the augmented reality yeah yeah this is really new level of uh, understanding because i would say the poster language like how you feel uh, the question do you think poster um, language poster visuals migrating to different um, areas to different art or uh, different kind of um, visual uh, approaches, visual communication? I guess there's a lot of ways to answer that. Um, I love it for visual communication. As you know, in this country is not a popular means of visual communication like it is the rest of the world. Um, everywhere you travel, there's posters. In this country, I'm sure in LA, you'll see them by theaters like New York. Um, we paste it up, but that's not really most of my work is for an international audience and that's a whole other thing to think about like because you have to be careful of who that's for and what you're saying and sometimes I go to the edge and sometimes people have questions about my work and I have to feel confident enough to stand behind it and say I understand how you might feel about it but this is the information this is how I want to present it um, and so that's always an interesting thing especially because a lot of my work is social political um, so you kind of have to walk that line. I love it as a means of communication. Yeah, I think it's also important right now when we communicate with the world because it's interpretation and somehow one poster is going to sing different in a different in a different world. And, you, and I had this kind of uh, stories. I heard a lot of this kind of stories. So it's something I think about and, you know, it's that, I guess, Sort of, you, I don't say roll the dice because I do a lot of research and I'm super careful. Um, but yeah, there's always that risk how someone may perceive your message, not at all how you meant it. True. Any other questions? Come on. You're like my students, ask questions. people asking if it's going to be available recording yes it will so um olga students i'm asking you questions you want to ask me questions um how do you guys work do you jump right on the computer computer part of it how do you handle um coming up with ideas Come on. i have to start calling on your students olga <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm also sketching like you. This is the way how I have to think. Um, yeah, uh, every poster designer and artist I speak to, we all start pencil and paper. We all start sketching. And I'm also, interesting. Yeah, I'm also testing whole ideas with my family because sometimes they give you my like feedback and 
this is how the wording coming into the poster mm -hmm. sometimes. So you have to talk with someone sometimes to to get like feedback, really feel interesting one, and it could work. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm lucky that um, two of my closest friends are world class poster designers, so <laughs> I bug them a lot, <laughs> and they're a tremendous help. Uh, but yeah, you, you can't work in a vacuum. You have to get yep. opinions and are things reading right and what do you see here? And, and that's really important. I mean, everything we do is kind of collaborative that way. And yeah. especially with a poster, which has to deliver a message. Yeah, the messaging is important. This is the most critical thing. Uh, guys, any other, like tell what, how you got your, because ideas, what's your process? What's your recipe? Madness. <laughs> Madness is good. Fearlessness and madness, all of it's good. Um, so, so Aaron, you kind of jump in with ideas when you say madness, anything goes? Uh, sorry, there's an echo because the... Uh... Um, yeah, I think, I think it just drives me crazy thinking of, of the idea sometimes. I think that's the, I think the hardest part is just trying to, trying to come up with an idea and, uh, and I think sometimes you, 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 ha you have a taste of something or you have a general notion, but then it's, the hardest thing is to, is to like chisel away at it or get at something, um, like concrete. And that kind of never changes. You always start off with, um, I mean, I, I, you're right. Coming up with ideas is difficult. For me, it's the most fun is that, is that process. I understand why it can be fr frustrating. And that's why you develop ideas. So you, you don't necessarily sketch and boom, there's an idea. There's a kernel of a thought there that you think about. And you start to say, does, does it send the message? Does it solve the problem? How will people react to it? You start to develop that idea. Um, and so that's kind of the beauty of working with other people. So you're in class, if you're in a studio agency, you're running it by th those people. I'm running it by friends, Olga's running it by her family. It's this idea to see um, how people react to those ideas. And then you develop it more and more. So I get my students say the same thing when I say the most fun you're going to have is coming up with ideas They look at me like I'm crazy, but it gets easier and you're more on the attack and you have a better sense of what needs to be done the more you do it. Um, so yeah, I, it's, it's always a mix of fright and um, exuberance for a new project because you really want to get started but you're always fearful of whether you're not going to come up with an idea or a good idea um, usually the execution that resolves itself once you have once you have the idea so i get it and that never changes you just get better at it is there reina i thought i saw a hand go up I see Yoon. Uh, hi, um, I just wanted to ask, like, how do you organize your research when you're starting a project? Organization and, and, and me, that's a funny question. Um, I create folders. They used to be traditional folders. Now they're folders on my computer. Every folder has a name for each project. Then each project has a place in a, in a main directory. And then I have subdirectories in those folders. So any sort of written material might be in a subdirectory. And then everything else is probably free for all in that folder, if I'm being honest. Um, and then I take a ton of notes. Um, if I need information written down, I'll use like Google Docs and put a lot of information on that. It's really accessible for me. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of ways, but everything has a title and everything has a folder that lives in it. And I keep everything. So. I have folders that are 15, 20 years old on backup hard drives because I'm afraid I'm going to need something from them someday. So hold on to everything. But it's I think everyone approaches it differently. Um, so my initial research is just from anywhere and everywhere. And then as I start collecting imagery, at some moment I start a folder or a directory, and then everything just gets piled in there. And then I have my 14 versions of my poster, version one, version two, version hope. Version hope and pray. First finish, 27th finish. We all go through this. Uh, Scott, can you uh, tell uh, guys um, what your favorite poster designer they need to know? 
Well, I, I think there are like what I call sort of the godfathers of, of poster design. I mentioned Saul Bass. Um, what's Herbert's first name? Oh, I'm spacing. Seymour Quas, Milton Glaser. I mean, these are all the, the, the designers that um, started this, it's called the New York School. And it was, I would say the beginning of what we're doing today. Um, unfortunately, and I have this conversation in my class all the time, they're mainly white men because back in 1950, that's who was doing it, but they kind of started all this. Um, today is there's so many great poster artists out there today. Um, and I think it depends on what genre you like. Um, I'm sure Olga has shown you ton. It's, it's such a, a amazing group of poster artists out there right now. But in terms of um, the ones you should look at, Herbert Matter, that was the other one. And he's a Swiss designer. He's kind of the first to start with collage. He's amazing typography and beautiful color palettes as well. Um, Faguda is, is another one, is a Japanese poster designer. And as a matter of fact, my, my Civilitas poster has a um, Fakuda flavor to it with the way he kind of creates imagery. I would definitely look at um, some of the things that, that he works on as well. Um, Oh my goodness, there's, there's, there's so many running through my head, but I would definitely start with those. Um, and then I believe, Olga, you have my timeline. So I, I would say from about 1930, 1940, off from that timeline to the present, I would be looking at all those artists. They, they all contribute to what we do today. Yeah, the timeline yeah. is amazing. I agree. I, I read it like a few times and just so I Thank can you. see the way how you explain the work process for your, your personal. I can see this timeline like even more right now how you work on that. Really great. Thank you. I had fun doing it. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. It's oh, this was so much fun. I wish you all had more questions. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Last chance. <laughs> Yeah, I think they have a lot of, uh, yeah, and they, we, they need to adjust, they adjust and like- I understand, I go, I go through that too, after the yeah. speaker leaves, then all the questions come. Thank you so much, Scott. Oh, what great. a great pleasure. Nice to meet everyone. Thank yeah, you so I much for having me. This was amazing. Bye-bye. Yeah, have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye. Good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>